Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for three very engaging papers. Um, you know, I, I, I think all of these papers really show the strength of, of, uh, of where we've come in the SATI project. You know, with not, none of these papers would have been possible a few years ago without access to the, to the microdata. Um, and I think it's a real step change in, in terms of, of, of tax research in the country. So on the one hand, I'm really enthused by the quality of the work. On the other hand, I'm incredibly depressed by all of the results, right? So, I mean, if you think about the South African context, we're in something of a fiscal crisis. We, um, on, the, on the expenditure side, they're, they're certainly, there's a discussion around massive austerity cuts from, from, gov from government. Um, we need more revenue, right? I mean, there's, there's no doubt about the fact that we, that we need to find revenue. And you've, you've, I think all of the papers address that point of saying, well, what are some of the ways in which we can sort of address tax avoidance, um, perhaps think about the behavioral effects, and in, in the case of, of Winona's paper, actually have a massive, massive reform, which would, would um, close uh, or reduce, at least reduce a tax expenditure. So, um, but unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not seeing huge potential in any of, in any of these avenues. Um, so perhaps if we start with Nadine's paper, I think this is in a way the most topical issue in, 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 in tax circles in, in the country right now. So the, on the, in terms of, of government departments that are looking for more revenue, they're constantly saying, well, let's push up that top marginal tax rate. 22% of, um, of revenues coming from that bracket, surely there's some money there. And then you have Nadine coming along and saying, well, actually, you might have a completely perverse outcome. Um, and so I think, you know, it's such important work. I've struggled to, to quite believe that it's as dismal as, as, as your result shows. So it, would be, it would be fantastic, I think, to, to sort of throw it at, at this problem more and more methods and really try and, and tighten that up because I do think right now we're a little bit, we're quite, we're quite stuck, right, between um, cert certainly social activists saying it, the elasticity can't be won um, the papers are saying, well, maybe, maybe it is, and, and until we, we, we make some mo movement there. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's very, very good work. Um, I hope the result is wrong. Let's put it like that. <laughs> um, on the second paper on, on tax refunds, so this is not something I know much about, and I'm going to talk very briefly about it. The thing that, so perhaps I just have a question here, and... Um, well, one comment and one question. So the first comment I was going to say was, uh, you clearly need access to the audit data, but you, get, you got that today, so yay. Um, I do think that's really going to help tremendously in trying to understand what, what, what is really going on here. The thing I, I didn't quite understand, um, and perhaps I'm just undercaffeinated, but what I didn't, didn't understand was why, um, why the length of the delay would result in you being less likely to apply for a refund in the future. I can understand why applying for a refund is going to be a disincentive, right? So you apply for a refund and then you're in a whole world of pain because you get audited or you get at least validated at the very least. But I don't really understand why the longer you wait for the refund, why that, why that length of time um, is, 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 a, is a reason why you would then not apply for a refund in, in, in the future. So perhaps you can address that um, when we come back. And then we're known as paper. So I completely understand the, the motivation for the paper. Um, tax expenditures are obviously something that are on the cards if one wants to think about more revenue and if you want to think about making the system more redistributive. And... I should put my hand up that first and foremost, I'm an inequality researcher. So obviously it's, it's, it's music to my ears to, to think about how do you make the system more, more progressive. My anxiety here though, is that we already are in a system where the savings rate in South Africa is incredibly low. The data you showed us suggests that 52% of taxpayers are not contributing anything to pension funds now, even in a very generous system where they're getting big tax breaks. Even the, even the rich are not making use of the full tax break. So when you're getting a 45% tax break and you're still choosing not to put money into your pension fund, then you're in, uh, then something else is going on, right? I mean, and some of that could be that 
people are just choosing not to not to use local pension funds because they simply have no faith in the country and they they would rather pay the 45 percent tax and take the money offshore okay maybe um it, it could just be that they feel so squeezed that that they, even at a 40 with a 45 percent tax break they don't feel able to contribute the full amount to the pension fund so I, you know, I worry hugely about the behavioural effects if one was to, to implement a system where that, that tax break gets reduced overnight to something like a 26% tax break across the board. Um, I, you know, I can certainly well imagine that, um, that the rich would, simp would, would, would then say, well, at a 26% tax break, I'm simply not willing to invest in local pension funds. I will, I will rather take the money offshore or I'll invest, invest differently. And an environment which is already savings constrained, um, that, that, that does worry me. So I, I don't quite know how you address that in the paper. Um, I mean, behavioral effects are outside of the scope of what you can do in pit mod and, and, and essay mod. But perhaps a little, a little bit more, uh, perhaps a bit more contextualization in the paper around what does savings behavior look like? How many people are saving for retirement? How many people cash in their retirement funds um, at the, uh, and, uh, when, when they change employment? So perhaps just a, a little bit um, more on the side of, of thinking about pension fund reform, or, or not pension fund reform so much, but pension, pension savings behavior and less just about the sort of mechanics of, 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 of tax expenditures. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, I had one more comment for Nadine. Um, so, and I think it's sort of, it's a, it's a general point of, uh, which is interesting across the papers. So Nadine put up a slide right at the start where she had per capita income of, of countries and the top marginal tax rate. And then the takeaway there was that South Africa is not a particularly rich country, but has this very, very high top marginal tax rate. Sure, that's true. But I think one wants to contextualize that within saying, and by saying that this is a highly, highly unequal society, right? So when you think about, about who, are, who in this economy are the people paying the 45% tax rate, those are not people living in a poor country, right? Those are people living in, 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 in a part of the economy which is really much closer to, a, to an upper income country than a than a than a you know than an upper middle income country. So perhaps just a little bit of um, of caution there. But yes, so overall a, a picture in which people seem to be starting to um, to uh, to not uh, not pay their VAT in full, which is not what we were seeing ten years ago, maybe, um, where we don't think we can push up the top marginal tax rate anymore, and where I'm somewhat negative about the about the future of tax expenditures. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, maybe before we go to the questions, uh, I would like to invite the, the presenters to just comment and give some of their perception on the... Thanks, Ingrid, um, for these comments. So um, I share your depression. So of course, when we uh, started um, this project, we kind of had hoped ourselves for a different result. Yeah. So, so we are very aware that the country desperately needs revenue and it would have been great if this was like also in terms of the data um, would have been like a like a helpful reform. So I, I, I fully understand that this is a very unequal society and I, I see like also a symbolic value in having a progressive tax scheme in such an unequal society. I think nevertheless it's also valuable to look at the data um, and check with the data whether the the aims that were set out with that reform were achieved. Um, I think the, the advantage of our identification strategy is that it's kind of transparent, so we can think about, um, I think, caveats, and we will try to carefully address them in the in the paper. But um, so Chris Axelson is part of the author team, and he also was, of course, kind of um, uh, alarmed with the results. Um, so it's just so we, we we think about it. It's not a paper yet; it's a project, and we're working on that. But at least our from everything that we've seen so far, we would not think that the country collected more revenue with that reform. 
Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, just to quickly uh, reply to the question of like, why would uh, length of delay right um, affect things? So, I mean, mainly there are two reasons, right? The the classic one is. Uh, so again, and this is uh, similar to the way people think about carry forward in corporate income tax systems, right? That um, if you don't adjust for time value of money, that means you're just changing the tax rate effectively. Um, and that, of course, can have um, <clears throat> changes on incentives on the margin. But then, um, you know, we think that is probably relatively tiny relative to the effect of uh, delays on credit constrained firms, um, right? And if you're credit constrained, having the money today versus having it two months from now can 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 make a big difference uh, in terms of solvency, in terms of the things you can do, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, uh, something we I had didn't show today is. Um, you know, we, we don't see big investment adjustments if you look at sort of six month or, or one year chunks, but we do see them in, especially in the month to month reporting. So, which is sort of suggestive that uh, what might be happening is uh, people are sort of spreading out the investment rather than, and whether that is a real response or it's a reporting response, it's, uh, it's very hard to say from the data, but um yeah, clearly, you know, and I was talking to Julia Mascani yesterday who was like, uh, clearly there is uh, plenty of evidence that people are foregoing the, so, you know, more than, I don't know, and I, I, I get, you know, worrying about revenue is, uh, is a real thing, um, but uh, I guess that's not how we were thinking about this, right? That's, uh, that's just sort of, uh, it's interesting. I think it applies to South Africa and applies to a lot of other places, uh, and uh, it's sort of something we know relatively little about. Um, yeah, I uh, thank you, Ingrid, for your comments. I think she makes very valid, valid points. Um, perhaps just with my insight into the data uh, and, you know, also what Nadine uh, has found in, in, in her paper, uh, what we have seen uh, with the sources of income and, and the deductions of the high income uh, taxpayers is, is that they, they definitely do do tax planning and uh, tax do play a role in how they declare income and, 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 um, and how they then uh, utilize uh, exemptions and deductions. And I think what's very important to, uh, to realize uh, also, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for tax arbitrage if you like in a high income earner. Many of them are also like directors of companies. Um, they've got uh, the company tax rate are currently at 27 percent. So. Uh, uh, I'm positive that tax planning uh, with taking forms in terms of capital income or other ways because I mean uh, uh, if you like a business person you can declare dividends and and there are different ways to actually earn your income and declare your income and dividends has got like a final withholding tax on it. Um, so I think just in the context of, of uh, behavior by, by those that are actually high income earners, they do have more flexibility to actually structure their, their salary income and how they're going to be taxed in the personal income tax system. On the other hand, this is that um, if you look like Ingrid has shown, uh, highlighted that if you think they can, uh, they can actually deduct up to 350,000, uh, currently the average is about 100. 75,000. I, I can keep, I, I think I've got a number on how many are actually at the 350,000 and, it, and it's, it's really, you can count it on your one hand. So it's clearly not, uh, uh, you know, high income earners are not going to, to deduct the full 350,000. Um, so they're not doing tax planning to get the maximum out of the, the tax incentive. That also tells you a story is, is there are other ways to actually minimize um, uh, tax liability. But if you think we are so generous, uh, and, and I mean it is a real concern that only 48% are providing for old age, 
uh, you know, when they retire one day uh, and you look at the averages that are claimed, uh, something is out of sync. And um, I think, uh, yes, behavioural changes are very important. Um, but I think is there's also need to have a really look if we can't uh, or should not broaden the tax system further and, and rather than... Uh, I've got the notion that we shouldn't have put the 45% at the one and a half million mark, but rather at the one million mark. So why would you bring in such a high marginal rate and then just cover a small high income earners percentage uh, where if you're above a million in South Africa, you are actually a high, in, a high income earner. But that's uh, another point for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the uh, interventions. Now we can open the questions for the for the members here in the room, and then you can also see whether there are some other questions online. Hey, thanks for all the presentations. I have a question on the VAT paper, and it's, uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, so the registration threshold in South Africa is relatively low. It's even lower than the UK and Italy. And if I were to make a guess, I think maybe 200 or so of the companies will pay 60, 70, if not 80% of the entire VAT. And uh, these will be managed by the large taxpayer unit. And on top of that, if you are a large exporter, most likely you will be in a free economic zone where maybe you will not be into the VAT at all or administered differently. So the question is then, you know, this skewed distribution, how would that affect your study? And then going to the point of the um, uh, discussant, which I agree on. I, I like your motivations on distinguishing between credit constraint firms and not, and maybe you could do that explicitly in the analysis. It would be actually a value added. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take another one. I think John Stone, uh, it was the second. Yeah. Then you come to. No. John Stone, was it? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much um, for the great uh, presentations. I have um, some questions and a few comments. The first one is on um, the marginal tax rate when you increase. It's, it's really amazing, the findings. So it's like um, the people on the top um, percentile decide to, to plan further and uh, they feel probably oh, you just end up impacting their behavior. And so probably instead of seeing more revenue as you increase their rate, they just decide, oh, this is unfair. Uh, they find ways of uh, planning better. That's very insightful. Thank you so much. Then uh, um, my second comment is about um, the, the refunds. In our country, the refunds is about um, a budgetary issue. We always have um, um, budget ceilings of how much we can refund. So whether the refund delays or doesn't delay is about really availability of budget. Um, and uh, it's interesting to imagine that when you delay it, then um, the people are likely not to, to claim more refunds. Um, but also w we have sometimes a challenge of um, invoice tradings. Many of the refunds are not actual uh, refunds. So sometimes a delay, you need to over scrutinize it and make sure that these are, are valid refunds so that you don't lose revenue. I wonder in your in your study, have you looked at other um, aspects that may influence uh, like invoice trading? I don't know whether it's a case that you considered. Then uh, the issue about uh, um, the, the pension funds. For us, it's, it's by the way compulsory. I don't have a say whether I should uh, contribute to NSSF or pension. It's automatic. When I'm employed in a given uh, government, I have to pay NSSF and it has to be, uh, it's not, it's mandatory like. Um, but the way we calculate it is uh, I, you first get my gross pay and then remove the taxes and then that's when you remove um, the amounts for NSSF and pension. So in our case, it's as if it's not exactly um, a, a tax expenditure because the tax is already uh, removed. Um, uh, is that, um, is it a different kind of scenario in South Africa? Thank you so much. Yeah, we, yeah, just next to him. Um, thank you. I think it's good uh, uh, papers. Um, my question, especially because we're grappling with the issues of revenue, as the discussant says, I think on the refunds, uh, pre 
2018, post-2018, um, and first-time filers. Um, I think it could be e easily explained by the fact that in 2018 post, you do away with field audits for first-time filers, where in the first instance, you wanted to verify uh, the physical presence of that particular taxpayer. And 2018 post, you use certain technologies to be able to say, I can, I can for sure tell who, who you are and where you are then that sort of leads to, to delays. But what I wanted to just make sure of, I understand, at what point do you call it a delay? Because there's legislative provisions around what time do you have to actually process it. Thank you. Yeah, let's have those three, then after we'll take the next one. Can you start, uh, Jacob? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for all of these questions. Uh, so let me start from the first one and let's talk, please, more. Um, because, uh, you know, we, it's a little troubling. Um, we, you know, we, we, we started talking to Wynona back in, back in April when we presented this in, in Johannesburg, in Johannesburg and um, <clears throat> we, we unfortunately still have trouble understanding exactly what it is that we're counting in terms of waiting time. And uh, the latest information we have seems like uh, <clears throat> these are really waiting times that uh, have to do with interest payments, uh, et cetera. And, and we, we really, really, really need to understand precisely exactly what it is that these dates we're looking at exactly represent and what it is we're measuring. The audit data, I mean, right, we got access to it today, so we, we literally have not looked at it at all, um, but we're very much looking forward to, and of course that would include, uh, my understanding is payment data. We'll see. Um, but uh, that would also, <clears throat> of course be be very interesting to look at um if you have further insights into like i said let's absolutely talk uh, because uh if you have further insights as to why exactly um the changing waiting times happened um that would be that would be extremely interesting to us and then you know we're thinking of doing this sort of uh like a donut right uh leaving a hole in the middle and looking sort of further left and further right from october 2018 precisely because we imagine there was some backlog in the first uh, month or two and and we'd rather we'd rather do away with that even though you know it means giving up sample size um Regarding budgetary issues and invoice trading, you know, as usual when it comes to evasion, if we knew it was happening, it wouldn't be happening. Uh, and uh, so it makes it a little harder than just saying, well, is there invoice trading? You know, there, like I said, uh, there have been, uh, apparently there have been sort of, there is anecdotal evidence that it does happen. Um, although it's it's very hard to say um, how widespread it is, um, and sort of that is sort of uh, why we think it's it's perfectly legitimate that uh, this is sort of a trade off that VAT that the tax administrations have to make, right? Uh, you can't just be handing out the refunds willy nilly, but on the other hand, uh, what we're looking at is, if you wish, is the other side of the coin of that is like okay, but. Uh, are you gonna just hold on to the refunds forever? And uh, you also don't wanna do that, right? So, so that's sort of where we're coming at this from. Regarding the skewed distribution of, uh, of VAT payers in, in South Africa, that is a very interesting comment. Um, we had not really engaged with that other than thinking about sort of the different sides of exporters and everybody else, right? That is sort of something that we, we, we've, um, we've engaged with. Uh, but you know, I, I, I mean, of course, in terms of tax payments, the, the biggest taxpayers are the ones that are most relevant for obvious reasons. Um, given the effects that we're seeing on investment or that we're, you know, this, the, the motivational evidence we're seeing on uh, regarding effects on investment, one fear and, you know, can credit constraint, on, uh, regarding credit constraint, we can link it to corporate tax data where we can see interest payments and so we can see whether you have loans or not. So that is definitely something we're planning to do. Um, but, uh, you know, it's nonetheless not necessarily obvious that you don't care about the investment uh, of, of the tiny firms, right? And in the sense that, uh, 
in terms of what this could mean for firm growth, in terms of what this could mean for sort of uh, the dynamics of firms going forward. We have very limited time. We need to have uh, just one minute. One minute. Yeah. Okay, I hope I understood the question right. Perhaps just saying is, is that if you look at the, how pension uh, deductions are claimed, uh, usually if you like low or low middle income, your ability to actually provide uh, for your retirement deduction and make use of the tax uh, tax incentive are more limited and what happens also in practice is, is that uh, in if you are with an employer that has got compulsory contributions to a pension uh, uh, pension contributions, deductions, uh, it's usually limited uh, to a certain percentage of your of your gross income. Um, so they are like limitations on how much you can contribute, but we also got retirement annuities. So if you want to supplement your contribution, you can do it with like retirement annuities. And many people have done that in the past, uh, that they will, uh, before the tax year ends, will actually put more money to make use of, of the of of the, of the tax break. Um, given what we see now in the high income earners and, and, and the averages that are claimed there, uh, it seems that it, it's not so much driven to go to the maximum, the 350,000 to make use of say a 41 or a 45% marginal tax rate. Um, uh, so I think this is that uh, it's not only the tax system that matters uh, when, when you save or when you to plan your, your, your taxable income and your tax liability, especially for those that are high income earners. It's like uh, Ingrid has alluded to, you know, they might decide to rather take their money or offshore. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate all the presentations. And we hope that uh, they also the audience has learned a lot about what we are doing. Thank you so much.